So I'm very honored and mesmerized to have this walk through the Artissima with Francis Reynolds, which is a collector but also a great patron and support of art and a friend also. We share different experience, but I think that while we walk, we can share this experience with you. We selected six galleries. Uh, basically two with a solo presentation, one uh, with two artists uh, and the other two and the other three with like a group exhibition for which we are going to just uh, present one or two work of one artist inside uh, the group uh, display of this free gallery. The first artist uh, that we are going to see and I'm going to introduce uh, is uh, Liliana Moro in the stand of uh, Francesco Pantaleone, a gallery from uh, uh, Palermo. And she's one of the artists that will represent Italy at my pavilion in 2019. Neon piece sentences are quite recurrent in art. Poetry is also recurrent in art. Also, Francis select just after another work, which has, you know, Borges as a reference. So, like speaking words are like quite important. Definitely are important for Liliana Moro, which produced many, many um, neon pieces. I remember Pane Quotidiano. I remember uh, for sure. For sure, also, né in cielo né in terra. I remember also, ancora o ancora, which has always this kind of game of war. And this one is quite uh, new. The word is uh, absent, maybe it's like suggesting more the idea of like a suspension or a void, or to put in bracket something that is like lighter enough not to be need to be mentioned again. And uh, I would like also to say that this work uh, refers also to like an installation she did uh, when she did her last uh, solo exhibition in the Galleria Mi Fontana, which is not anymore existing, but was at the time uh, the one that was representing uh, Liliana. Now Francesco is uh, uh, the only gallery in Italy that uh, represents uh, Liliana. And uh, that exhibition was exactly titled uh, you know, nothing, just like two brackets with dots in between. And the work was basically walking through broken glasses to reach like a people where to see from the other rooms, but just like to this like limited perspective, like a glass um, work made in glass, this one, cuts, cuts. And it is not exactly the first work she did using this uh, element. The first one was actually the same, but made in wood. It was made by the prisoner of the female uh, department of the prison in San Vittorio in Milan, who was made it also for prisoner, and the title was Torno Subito, which means I will come back soon. And it was, of course, like, again, like quite, uh, quite rough, specific, simple design, not simplicistic. All the work of Liliana is simple, but not simplicistic, it's always poetic. And the title, Torno Subito, means almost like, you know, I will have a jump in this life and I will come back at one point. And like this jump, let's make it as like emotional and long as possible. I believe that also this work, qualche volta volano, qualche volta cadono. Pietre has the same uh, simple but not simplistic power of let us imagine something that, that can fly as thought or something that can fall down as like that there is like a gravity as stone. And to me also come back the idea of, I don't know, like uh, verba volat scripta manet. That normally you want to interpret it as something that needs to be written to be to be real and to be concrete and to be said and to be like a statement while if it is just like mentioned verbally, orally, will not have like an, an effective uh, uh, rules while as it has been used at the beginning was exactly the opposite, better than things fly and stay if, if one could remember them, could take it as like a lesson, more than became dogma, unless this was as uh, Aristotle or Jesus Christ was interpreting this uh, message. So I believe that also for Liliana Moro, this work is about, uh, you know, levitation and gravity and, you know, letting things 
be light instead of being uh, heavy and uh, have like an heavy emotional uh, effort as stone that fall down. The stone, some of these drawings are drawings, very simple. Some other, there is like a thread that of course uh, perforate the paper and, uh, and someone doesn't have anything. So. This work uh, connects to many other artists and one that is not here in the fair. Um, he's born in Spain, but he considers him himself Brazilian, is Daniel Stigman. And um, he's part of my collection, so maybe you should follow him um, when you get a chance. But he's done fantastic um, exhibitions, and he was in the last uh, Ven uh, Biennale of Lyon. So. Yes, and Daniel Stillman, I agree with uh, Francis, that is like uh, kind of like sharing many aspects of, uh, you know, of lightness uh, as uh, Liliana does, with very emotional, simple, uh, delicate, uh, floating uh, sculpture made of like little branches of tree or like curtains uh, or uh, like things that are like, we will call it as Italian mirici quoting uh, Giovanni Pascoli, which is not my favorite author, but in this case is like quite appropriate. And now we move in front. And the second artist of my pavilion is uh, Enrico David, not Patrizio Di Massimo, but they share something together because they come from the same, uh, the same city. I mean, they come from Italy, of course, but they are like both from Le Marche and Ancona, basically. They both are painter, but Patrizio elaborate through the years a specific uh, approach. And uh, I will quote uh, this painting as uh, quite grotesque. The face uh, are always a little bit bigger than the reality or a little bit smaller. Never ra real size, which is a peculiarity, not that just of, uh, of Patrizio Di Massimo. If we think, for example, to the sculpture of uh, Katarina Fritsch, for example, or uh, many other one that doesn't come to my mind at the moment. Hmm? These two are like, of course, self-portrait because the artist used normally to uh, represent himself as is the simple kind of reference, visual reference. And the girl is, of course, the wife, the partner, the wife now. I was even the witness of their wedding. And it's Nicoletta Lambertucci, which is also a curator. So they share a lot of things. And uh, I think that the opposition of these two paintings is quite relevant as like a metaphor of working on dichotomy. In one place they are kissing, on the other place they are fighting. In both the cases there is like uh, some witnesses which are little, detailed, uh, insect, butterfly, ladybug, uh, cockroaches, ant and fly that kind of populate uh, their face and uh, their emotional uh, encounter. His paintings are uh, the insects that you might have seen in, in many of um, you know Renaissance paintings, especially in northern, northern Europe. He says it doesn't mean it's not a symbol, but in fact it is because um, he says it's, they represent um, decadence, you know, that, that, that life is, you know, perennial in a, in a way, but also, sort of, you know, goes into death. And I asked him, I said, but do the insects, does that mean that there's like a, you know, end of, final of your relationship? And he said, no, no, not at all. But um, anyway, so this is, he's very much in love. He's going to be a father. So, um, very soon. That's why he left yesterday. And um, anyway, he's a super artist. He's um, going to be showing in Brussels next week. No? So, I'm super excited to go and visit him. But we move now to another work, one drawing of uh, Leon Ferrari. Leon Ferrari is an artist that has lived all his life in Argentina, passed away. I knew him personally and he was quite an activist in during the dictatorship and also very much against the Catholic Church. And um, in fact, he had a lot of his work censored in like 10 years ago. And um, one of them was in a metro station of him, like dressed, sort of standing against a metro subway photo and um, of the, with the figure of Christ. But anyway, I was very surprised to see a work of his here. He's a very important artist. And this is a, a photograph of a scan of a, a Shelley's work. I started to collect um, poetic art recently, so very incipiente, but I find it very interesting. 
and um, I was stunned to see that he has, you know, a text of a poem of uh, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, the famous uh, writer, Argentine writer. And then we, um, I think it's just, I can read it aloud, but I think it's, you know, intimacy that you can come and read it yourself, you know, later on. But um, I thought it was um, very beautiful to run into a, a work of his. Uh, they're running, the cow is running his, their, uh, his estate, but um, in a context of Artissima, which I have to say has been lovely because you discover little jewels all over. You just have to pay attention. So um, just ask any questions if you need to have any further. So we can, I mean, I like also the idea that we stand before in front of like a suspension of sentences of Liliana Moro and now we enter in the quotation basic of like a very relevant poems, uh, you know, written on top of this uh, simple print of a painting of Egon Schiele. So there is like a kind of like no connection, but like a nice uh, float uh, of movement from one into the other. And both the work are quite like... Uh, domestic and simple and minimal, uh, but you know, full of poetry. And now we move uh, to something that is more like kind of uh, environmental and involving like new media is like sound. And we, wa we go to Vivian Kakuri's solo presentation at uh, Gentil Carioca. This is Vivian Kakuri, a young Brazilian artist living in Sao Paulo. We invited her to, to do a residency in some, at the Delfina Foundation and a residency uh, can act as a platform to expand the artist's development. And as a result of that, it's been fantastic what she's been doing. She's, um, she studied at Princeton, did her master's degree there in music. And so she takes her music into um, her art, which is, um, you can see her music that comes, you know, in here. And um, she experiments with different instruments. And now in Sweden, she was invited. To, she's going to be doing a project there. And she discovered the most incredible organ that she learned. She's incredible ability to learn how to play. And so you, got, you understand her connection to music and to life also through, through music. You see all of these stones and elements. They make a different sound how she works with the different elements, which are very strong materials, but also it's got the fragility of the things that you see here hanging in them, uh, create this create sense of connection to, also to intimacy and to poetry. Um, this last project was a result of her residency at the Delfina Foundation in London. And she did research on the mosquitoes and their connection and how they, you know, they are in, in environment. And um, it, she, she was fascinating about, uh, uh, fascinated about the sound that these mosquitoes um, generate. And it, she discovered in this research of hers that that's when they are mating. So I discovered also that mosquitoes are the most active sexually in the whole of the planet better than man or woman or other insect. Anyway, so she's, she's composing a music right now, um, which will be performed um, after her residency in Sweden about, um, with the sounds of, of this mosquito noise. A part that I also discovered recently that mosquitoes was pre-existing to dinosaurs. Uh, so they are like very ancient, but I don't think that was like an aspect that Vivian was uh, for now interested to discover. The reason why I like the work of Vivian is because I never worked with her personally. I saw few performances and one big installation. And the reason why I like her work is because she's able to condense and contain all this kind of big effort and quite epic performances of ins or installation also in like smaller object which I don't think they are like a, a reduction but it is like the same in a more like uh, you know simple way or in a more like uh, domestic way or in a more like uh, uh, gesture that is still an action 
And of course, the work of Vivian, I imagine to be quite uh, diverse in terms of the media that she uses, which deal uh, with, uh, with, uh, with sound for sure, but deal also with performances. The work is also quite uh, very connected with collaboration also with other artists, so she's open to investigate possible co connection mainly with musician this work is quite you know powerful in the way that is like a manifestation of uh, how the sound and the low frequencies uh, can reverberate uh, in like a memento mori which is uh, as like a candlestick uh, with uh, two candles the first time that i saw her work was indeed uh, in the uh, Kim Chu Prize uh, in Venice a few years ago, and this was like kind of like becoming like a sort of like uh, pyramid, like a big tableau vivant of object one on top of the other, loudspeakers with all this kind of like kind of like candles. So I like also the ritualistic part. Uh, of her work, which to me, I don't know if I'm right, but connect also with like an animist, spiritual uh, way of seeing uh, religions uh, in Brazil. So I don't know, to me it also connected with uh, Candomblé and other, other uh, fascinating rituals still with myths uh, that have been crossing during also my research time uh, in, uh, in Brazil and uh, also at Francis. She's very related to the environmental issues that are so contemporary in, in this complicated world. So she brings it in attention also with the, through music. Totally. And I believe that it's true completely, but it's also true that uh, I feel uh, uh, Vivian is also kind of this shape, uh, giving me like also some uh, idea of like cosmic, of like uh, cosmic uh, lunar eclipse. I saw like a small. Uh, a work that a friend of mine from Brazil purchased recently, which is like almost like an eclipse, so bring me also to like a, you know, also like a macrocons vision and sound and the invisibility of things. Uh, reason why, with this in mind, we can move uh, to the next, uh, which has uh, some connection in a totally different visualization, and is the work of Joana Escoval. Her work is made mainly of this uh, object, so it's like uh, sculptural work. She does also performances, but most of the time I will consider her as like an alchemist in the sense that she really melt uh, the metals, uh, gold, uh, silver, brass, uh, and, uh, and the other one that is possible to melt uh, without being intoxicated. Any melting allowed also sort of intoxication, which is like, uh, you know, I don't know happy, but you know, she keep it as part of her process. And these sculptures are, uh, are indeed made in the same material that I was just mentioning before. There is all the three together. And uh, this one is like one single work uh, and is uh, rain titled and of course it is for me as like a sort of haiku a short uh, Japanese poem capable of like giving you the idea of like rain clearly shining it is a variable dimension in the sense that in case you want to purchase it you can split it not split it no but you can like accommodate in different room you can like make it squeeze in a smaller uh, wall or otherwise it can become bigger but what you cannot change and this is like crucial fundamental is the the diagonal which has a specific angle because actually Joanna didn't want to just represent the rain in silver but she want to represent the wind and the wind that is visible mainly through other apparition as like branches that move or as uh, the this one doesn't move or otherwise the rain that is according to the wind create like a specific diagonal so sometimes can go more straight some other times more horizontal in this case take this corner which I don't know which is the corner but is in fundamental to be able to install the work correctly. Uh, to install it correctly, I mean, I don't want to enter in detail, but the detail can be important. There, there are like two little holes on the back of this line that uh, allowed you to kind of uh, pin it in without visible things. So the work is like poor, clean, a clean cut, uh, let's say, which is uh, absolutely fundamental. The one that is in front of me, there that is like this free line banded uh, and other two 
even more bender and twisted, but like in an harmonic way, is a representation of the waves. And uh, all the work are, uh, of course, uh, unique. And is also that one made in brass and uh, in uh, silver, so two different material. And uh, everyone is unique, as I was mentioning before, but everyone, of course, can change uh, and can be more complicated. So can exist. The representation of ways that she will allow herself of doing is not just one. It could be like, I don't know how long, but as someone that keep making uh, drawings on like the same dog forever and ever again. All the time is different. All the time is the same object. I don't know when she will be done uh, of trying to represent the waves, but uh, until that moment she will uh, continues as well as this work I'm sure that exists in other in another version but the other version has a different corner a different kind of uh, uh, of uh, diagonal it's very beautiful in the sense that it connects to again to environment which I think is a very um, latent in today's um, polluted world and it also I think just this beauty of the po it's so poetic. Um, I personally, my daughter stu is st studied the science and environmental studies, and I think it's so beautiful that I want to give it to her for her birthday. But I think it's just the fragility of human nature and, and everything, I think, is fantastic. Some of these objects sometimes are also wearable. Wearable in the sense that they're like kind of circumference that you can put on your on your uh, around your neck, uh, not as like a jewelry, no. It's more like an exchange of energy. So maybe she organized in her performative uh, practice a walk uh, in special place with specific energy, potentially, or maybe just like uh, in a street, in a metro forest. And uh, people that participate uh, are invited to wear in different way these uh, metals uh, and to charge them. She considered them a bit as like antenna of reception between the in and out and vice versa. And then uh, these objects get the power or the energy of the person that has been wearing it. And indeed, uh, there is like a different way of oxidation. When I did it, mine became completely black. Too much power or too dark power. And let's move to the last one. Two artists coming from different countries but from uh, South America. One is from Venezuela and the other one is from Argentina, I believe. And I give you the floor to my dear Francis to introduce them. Lucia Pisani is a Venezuelan artist. She's now, because of all the crisis in Venezuela, all of these artists have lost their the nation in a way and so it's a constant diaspora and she's tried to recuperate that respiratory uh, through she does different forms of techniques she works here with terracotta and she uh, manipulated in such a way that she's put fabric on it and then she squishes it together a little bit like this that you can see and it's extremely organic and at the same time um, very poetic he can it can have different interpretations. It can even be a desert in a you know sand dune or in you know um, a mountain in an arid zone. So it's also addresses a lot of issues about environments. This is an earlier work of hers. Um, you can see, and she works with uh, the process of uh, photography. This is a self-portrait of hers, but I think they're very um, beautiful and also um, super interesting. She's not here? Yeah, she's here. Ah! ah. <laughs> Benissimo! <laughs> now you have to talk. Okay. <laughs> this one in particular was an homage to Lua Fuller. Um, actually, um, she was a pioneer in dance and illumination for theater, and the technique I'm using corresponds to her practice uh, because it's a very old technique in photography. Uh, it's a collodion wet plate. So you put the emulsion on top of the aluminum plate and that goes in the camera. So instead of getting like a positive on film, you get a negative, uh, sorry, a negative on film, you get a positive on a plate. And that's why a lot of my work has to do with materiality. Even these photographs become like a more of an object. 
and I work across uh, different media. That's what you see also in my ceramics, but a lot of the work is about gender, body, uh, I study contemporary dance as well, and have been based in London now for 10 years and working with Cecilia. And that's why also you see some of the sculptures overlapping on top of the body. So it's idea, this idea of a second skin, almost like an armor that you build around yourself. And that's why it has to do with textile, because I imprint the textile, but also clothes is almost like a second skin that you protect yourself against uh, the world and all the violence that is around us. I mean, I just I want to mention this. I mean, it was nice uh, to conclude uh, within like a circle, I like story that doesn't have an end and not even a beginning so let's say if we started with Liliana Moro which will be one of the artists of my last uh, of my next Venice Biennale in the Italian Pavilion this one is one of the artists of the Sao Paulo Biennale that just opened a few months ago within like a solo presentation uh, the Sao Paulo Biennale which you are also a member of the council uh, Francis, uh, this year was uh, composed by uh, 12 uh, solo presentation and uh, Alejandro Curuqueira from Argentina, from Argentina. You know, this like 12 presentation was quite diverse, quite like 12 different pavilions, let's say, in same, uh, inside the same block. Plus, uh, there was uh, other other six group exhibition curated especially for, by six uh, artists uh, which was invited to curate an exhibition including their own work and this is one of the 12 solo presentation so this is an artist that is from argentina he's interested of course in abstraction and geometric abstraction but he wasn't looking at europe but uh, the nazca valley and all of the pre-columbian past to understand like form and line and geometry and uh, and then he integrated that into european modernism so what you see here is a mixture of you don't see any of the pre-columbian past but more like a minimalist zen approach into painting he's more of a Bryce Marden kind of artist, but very much ingrained into Latin American past. <laughs> and I think that with this one, we conclude our tour. Hope that you enjoy it. And uh, thank you, Milovan. You're great. Okay. Thank you, Francis, for your company and for your speech. Thank you.